obey Zoom. Say again. May 10th will be on Zoom. Thank yeah, you. May, yeah, he's in Arizona, so that, that's going to be in Zoom. Yeah, Kevin, who's uh, I think still on here, is uh, is in Arizona. And this is kind of a last minute thing we're doing. It, it makes a nice prelude to all of the Lincoln Memorial events to give us a lot of background about the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, David? Yes. Can I talk about the event on May 19th? Yes, I forgot about that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No problem. So the Arts Club of Washington will be hosting a dinner, excuse me, not a dinner, a talk at 6 p.m., free to the public. Um, we'll be having Harold Holzer as our speaker, and uh, he will be talking about one of our charter members of the Arts Club of Washington, uh, Benjamin Chester, or Daniel Chester French. Um, and he'll be, you know, talking about his book, The Monument Man. Um, we'll have copies of that book there, um, compliments of Chesterwood. Um, it'll be a really a great kind of a um, prelude to the upcoming events for the Lincoln Memorial Centennial. And that's in person. That's in person. Correct. It is. Club. Okay. Yep. Did you did you met you mentioned that somebody from Chesterwood's going to be at the event too? Well, I've been in contact with them. Um, <laughs> so I, they're going to be there on Sunday, but um, right. I'm getting books. They're shipping me some books for you know if anybody wants them that I'll we can sell the Monument Man book that Harold did back in 2017 for them on Daniel Chester French. About what date is the Arts Club meeting? It will be on May 19th. That's the Thursday before this busy yeah. weekend. Correct. Well, Carolyn, if you could if you could get me the, the information on it, Carolyn, and, and I'll get it, I'll put it up, get something written on our website about it. Sure. And what time will that be? 6 p.m. Okay, anybody else have anything they want to make sure everybody knows about? Okay, then I am going to turn it over to John O'Brien and let him introduce Ed Steers. I'll just add a quick reminder for all the events and uh, news about the club, please refer to the Lincolnian.org website, Lincolnian.org. We have all this uh, information on events, how to register for those events and news pertinent to the club and to Lincoln. So please uh, go to lincolnian.org frequently and use that as your news source and feel free to comment on anything you see there. We are happy to try to respond. With that uh, said. John, one, one more thing I wanna mention. We are still collecting donations to help pay for all of this stuff for the Lincoln Memorial. So please, 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 please feel free to write us a check and send it to the address that's on the, the donation page on our website, or go to the donate button and, and you can pay through uh, PayPal or, or credit card. And for the and, many folks on this call who have already made a donation, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Yes. Mm. Okay, go ahead. All right. Ed Steers, need oh. no introduction. <laughs> what? <laughs> A uh, longtime member of the club, Ed Steers, is a doctorate in biology. He has been uh, fascinated with Lincoln for, geez, half your life now, right? Uh, 1982. Has written the go-to documents on the assassination. He is the international expert on John Wilkes Booth and all things about Ford's theater and, and Lincoln's last days. Uh, so much appreciate the work that Ed has done over the years in his publications, in his uh, speeches for the club and nationally. And we look forward to uh, reliving with him some memories of what he experienced from the club when he was president from 1982 to 1984 uh, and had the privilege of knowing a number of our original founders and still associating with them. So it is the vital bridge to our, our history and our past and we are looking forward to engaging with all the past presidents who are here, other longtime club members, 
and building on all the information that uh, Ed Steers is going to share to us uh, today about the early days of yore. Ed Steers. Okay, am, uh, am I up on screen now? You are. You see the uh, founding. I don't see uh, your shared screen yet, no. Do I have to hit share screen? Yes. yes, you have to hit shared screen. Okay, and then what? There. Once you've done that, you're there, right, good. Are, are we there? Yep. Okay, so hopefully you see the founding and a few tall tales. <laughs> yes. Very good. Okay, so um, this is gonna be, I'm gonna do a PowerPoint for two reasons. One is I think you'd rather look at pictures than me, but secondly, I'm at that stage now where I need cues um, or else I, uh, I, I can't remember what I was going to say or what I should say. Um, so very briefly, um, let me put myself in perspective with this whole thing. Uh, this is me in 1978. Um, I was a member of the Northern Virginia Relic Hunters Club, and every April we would put out a big Civil War show at Kenna Temple in uh, Fairfax, and um, I was the only Yankee in the group, of course, uh, everybody else were Confederates, they used to call me Mr. Lincoln, and so, you know, it was, uh, I used to rub their nose in it every, every show, I would put out an exhibit on Lincoln, that, so this particular year in 78, I had a couple of very, very rare Lincoln photographs. And I had just the previous year bought a few Lincoln documents at the Swan auction in New York. So I put out this little exhibit. Um, and the shows run Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Sunday is mornings are usually about dead time. And this little guy came through the door in a starched white shirt. Um, and bow tie, and uh, he saw the A Lincoln and he made a beeline for the table, stood there, he read every word and examined every photograph and turned to me and said, hi, I'm George Landis, president of Lincoln Group of DC and I've got to get you to be a member. So we had a nice chat. And um, before he left, he said he wanted my phone number because he was gonna call me and get me to the next meeting which he did and I did. And George and I became extraordinarily fast friends for the very short period of time uh, that he lived. He, he uh, fortunately got lymphoma and died in um, 1984. George, just, just a wonderful, wonderful gentleman. Uh, so I joined the club in 78, became president in 82 to 84. George manipulated me into that position. Uh, there were problems at the time and uh, I can't go into those now, but um, that's, that's how I got into the group through George and that's how I got to be president of Lincoln Group during that period. Well, I, the reason I'm giving this talk this evening, I believe, is because I was having a chat with John O'Brien and David Kent, and I happened to mention that I had this cassette tape that when I became president in 82, Bert and I were really good friends by that time, uh, I gave Bert my cassette player and the tape, and I said, Bert, I want you to reminisce about forming the Lincoln Group um, and, and anything else. Now, uh, Bert is just a marvelous storyteller. Um, he, uh, he knows everyone. He knew everyone in the Lincoln field. And that's not an exaggeration. He knew every Lincoln historian from uh, uh, James Randall to Benjamin Thomas to Harry Pratt, uh, Larston Bullard, uh, uh, William Barton, you name it. They, they all knew Bert. Uh, and he knew them. And when any of them ever came to Washington for an event or to do research in the archives or library of Congress, the very first thing they did was call Bert and set up a dinner meeting with Bert. Uh, he, he sort of became emphasis, uh, famous in that way. He, uh, Bert was, was a Lincoln scholar. There's no doubt about it. He, he, he knew a great deal. So, um, the difficulty is, uh, Bert's a storyteller. This tape runs over an hour, and it took Bert a half an hour before he even got to uh, talking about how he formed the Lincoln Group. And he has difficulty uh, completing a sentence. He'll, he'll get down to the verb, and he'll say, oh, that reminds me. And then he goes off on a tangent about some anecdote of some individual. And so 
this tape is like a big bushy tree. It just runs runs all over runs all over the place, but it's marvelous because Bert, I said, is a great storyteller and he knew everyone. He was he, he was plugged in all over. So this, I guess, is the first institutional memory of the group. I don't know where we would be if um, if we didn't have this cassette tape. It's so so lucky that I thought of doing this and saved it <laughs> that we still have that that we still have it because the second um, institutional memory for for this group, of course, is the Lincolnian and. When I became president, one of the things I did was to reactivate the Lincolnian. There was a Lincolnian in the 40s and 50s. It was kind of typewritten, circulated sheet, but they stopped doing it. So uh, when I became president, I decided to reactivate it if George agreed to be editor, and he did. So it turns out that I have every issue from 1982 to 2006. That's about 160 copies of the Lincolnian. So Clearly, the institutional memory is here. Obviously, this covers meetings, people, events, everything that's going on. So between the tape and this full set of Lincolnian, I think we have a pretty complete history. But you know, there's a little bit of difficulty. I've read, reread through this again, and there are some errors and mistakes in it, um, which hopefully we can correct. I mean, there's one article that says that there are three founding members to the Lincoln Group, which is not true at all. There's only one founding member, it, it, it is Bert. Um, you will notice that the time is 12 noon. We met at lunchtime. When I joined in 78, we were originally meeting at Blackie's House of Beef. And um, I think it went out of business. Um, there's a, I noticed there's a couple old timers up there, including Bob Willard. Um, but I think Blackie's went out of business. We moved to Charlie's on Wisconsin Avenue. Um, and uh, I can't get into this now, but this is one of the reasons George got me to be president. Th this was a problem having lunchtime meetings because um, the group was fading. And I really credit George Landy's with holding this group together. And the solution was to go to evening meetings. I, and I can't get into that now. There's, there's just not enough time. Unfortunately, I have no photograph of Bert, which really puzzles me, bothers me. I have over 8,000 uh, two by two coat of color slides of every Lincoln site in the United States and every graveyard and tombstone and all along the Lincoln Trail. I don't have any picture of Bert, but that's a shame. Uh, well, I'm not going to say Bert ran away from home, but uh, he told me he was crazy about the circus and he wanted to join the circus. And as a very young man, he um, he left home and uh, he just briefly once said to me, he rode the rails and hobo camped his way across the country, uh, landing in Washington, D.C. in the 20s. And he got a job on the Metropolitan Police Force. And there he worked until World War II. And during the war, Bert and a few others were taken from the Metropolitan Police Force and assigned to the Capitol as added security during the war to protect the Capitol from sabotage and Congress from any dangerous, dangerous uh, things that might happen, which is kind of silly, isn't it? Who could imagine anybody attacking the Capitol of the United States? So, uh, while Bert served as a Metropolitan policeman at the Capitol, he had what we call the gravy shift. It was four to midnight. And Bert says he spent that time writing hundreds and hundreds of letters, literally to everybody in the country that had anything to do with Lincoln. And it's another reason why he was so plugged in with so many of the historians and Lincoln people. So as a result of that, he is offered a job on the Capitol Police, which he accepts. He rises to the rank of lieutenant um, and serves out till he retires and is known by everyone then as Lieutenant uh, Sheldon. And this served Bert well too because it puts him in contact with politicians that become rather, rather important. Well, as Bert tells it, he subscribes to the usual Lincoln publications of the day and Hobbies Weekly, which he loved. And um, every February around Lincoln's birthday, these uh, publications would write up happenings, Lincoln happenings in the country, much like 
Frank Williams, Judge Williams has done in the Lincoln Herald over the years. And so this particular February 34, they hobbies wrote up about Lincoln groups in the country and they mentioned Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, Springfield. So Bert says, well, why not Washington DC? Why don't we have one? Now, Boston was a real Lincoln group. I mean, I mean they're like us. They, they formed to study Lincoln, promote him and honor him. I think the Philadelphia, Chicago and Springfield back then were political. They were Republican clubs. Um, uh, so so the, their purpose wasn't to study and promote Lincoln. I, I don't think they were. At any rate, Burr says, why not have, uh, have a club in DC? So Burr goes to uh, what was the, the best used bookstore in Washington at the time, long gone. I, I think the owner was Paul Attell. Can't be sure about that. Um, not that it matters. So Bert goes to, to uh, Paul and says, Paul, who buys your Lincoln books? And Paul says, well, my, my number one uh, purchaser is M.L. Wilson, um, Milburn Lincoln Wilson. And Bert says, well, tell me a little about him. He said, well, he's under Secretary of Agriculture uh, under, under Henry Wallace, and he's a, he's a great lover of Lincoln. So this is typical of Bert. Bert. Bert doesn't write him a letter and doesn't call him on the phone. Bert sends him a telegram because he knows, he knows he'll open and read the telegram if it's a telegram. And so in a telegram, he tells uh, Wilson of his interest in forming a study group of Lincoln, a Lincoln group in D.C. And uh, Wilson has his secretary call Bert and call him over for a meeting at the Department of Agriculture. So Bert goes and they sit down and have a nice chat. And, and Wilson is very enthusiastic. But he says, uh, I really can't help you, uh, Bert, much because I don't know anyone in Washington who is a Lincoln fan. But he says, what I will do, I will write you a letter endorsing your idea and recommending you, and you can use that letter if you wish any way you want. And um, if you need any money at all for postage, telephone calls, flyers, he said, you come to me and, and I'll see that you get the money. So uh, Bert set out then to organize a dinner meeting with a few people that he knew were Lincoln fans that he had access to. Um, there were, I believe, eight at that first meeting, according to Bert, and here are three of them. Uh, to the left is Frederick Delano, who is the uncle of uh, President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. John Claggett Proctor in the middle. Some of you will know of John Claggett Proctor. He was a journalist in Washington with the Washington Star. And every Sunday, Washington Star, Proctor would write a major feature article on history in Washington, D.C., and uh, at one point, I think he gathered about 50 of them together and uh, published a book, a very nice book on the history of Washington. And Tony Dondero, Anthony Dondero was a congressman from Michigan. And um, this gentleman, uh, who wasn't from Washington, uh, but was in Washington for several weeks for some unknown reason, and it's Stuart McClellan, who uh, was president of Lincoln Memorial uh, University. So these four with Wilson and Bert and a gentleman named Garrett and, and the eighth person that Bert couldn't remember his name, but he knew he was a patent attorney that lived on Upshur Street. So Bert calls a dinner meeting at the Hay Adams Hotel, which clearly was the upscale hotel in Washington. It, I, I guess it still is an upscale hotel, but it was the most prominent one located um, up here. Uh, on 16th Street, opposite uh, Lafayette Park and the White House. I see this is now, what is it, Black Lives Matter place. So they met in this wonderful dining room at Hay Adams, the eight of them had dinner, and then they adjourned to a room on the second floor. Of course, Bert knew the manager of the Hay Adams. He knew everybody. Uh, and Bert describes it as a storage room that was up there. It was kind of dark and dank and Chairs were stacked up all along the wall. So these, they took down the chairs, formed a circle, and John Claggett Proctor got up and read 
one of the articles he had written uh, in the Star on Lincoln in Washington. So there you have the first meeting and the first speaker, John Plaga Proctor. Well, they held a second meeting at the Hay Adams and did the same thing, except this time Bert says there are about two dozen, 25 people because uh, each of the eight went out and brought another person or two in with them. Um, and at this point, um, Bert went to the famous Colonel Randall Truett who ran Ford's theater and uh, told Truett what he was doing and Truett was extremely excited. And he said, look, Bert, you can, your group can hold its meetings in Ford's theater. Um, and on the 14th of April and 12th of February, those anniversary dates, we'll have a big gala meeting and um, make, a, make a big deal out of it. <clears throat> well, uh, Truett also said, Bert, if you get me the list of uh, membership of some of the clubs in Washington, I will send out flyers on behalf of your group. And so Bert um, remembers getting the um, mailing list of the daughters of the, the Washington chapter, the Daughters of American Revolution, the Daughters of Union veterans, and then there is, is um, old time residents of Washington. I'm not sure if that's the title of the group, but it, it was, you get the idea. And true to his word, true mailed out flyers and they started drawing very large crowds for these meetings at, at Ford's Theater. Now there's a big gap um, in the tape um, between 1935 and 1950. Bert doesn't talk about meetings. He talks about people. He goes into an awful lot of stories about all the various famous people in the Lincoln fields that he knew, um, beginning with um, um, Madame Dorothy Lehman Tilliard, the, the daughter of Ward Hill Lehman. Now she lived in an apartment on Wisconsin Avenue. Um, Helen Nicolay, the daughter of uh, John George Nicolay lived in an apartment on Connecticut Avenue. So Bert uh, went and introduced himself to them and sort of befriended both of them. He used to visit them on multiple occasions and so he, he, I just picked out a few things, but he said, uh, 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 Madame Tilliard was always irritated by the pronunciation of her father's name. She said her name was Lehman, not Lehman or Lemon. And um, if Bob O'Connor is out there in the group tonight, uh, I, uh, Bob O'Connor is a Ward Hill Lehman biographer and he might wanna comment on that. Um, Helen Nicolay, he described as a very shy, reserved, dignified lady, a little too dignified for Bert's taste, he said. Um, Bert was one of those old time gentlemen. He never made a derogatory statement about anybody. He was always very careful. And, and um, he talked them into coming to the Lincoln Group meeting, if you can imagine. And, um, he said uh, the first time the two of them got together in his presence, he noticed that um, there was a definite coolness between the two. Um, he, he couldn't quite figure it out, but every time they got together, he said there was a lack of cordiality. He was always quick to point out that they were dignified and proper and never rude, but there just was this lack of cordiality. Well, the other two people that used to attend meetings rarely, but attended them or that have a direct association um, with Lincoln are, of course, uh, Helen Leal Harper, the granddaughter of Charles Leal. She lived in New York, I think Pelham, New York. Um, and uh, even when I was president, she maybe came to two meetings a year. I would pick her up at Union Station and drive her to the meeting, or if I couldn't, George. Landy's would pick her up and bring her. And of course, the other was Richard Dyer Mudd, the grandson of Dr. Mudd. Whenever he was in Washington, we would get together. And he uh, was one of the speakers when I was president. I invited him to be a speaker. And um, we had a very nice relation. Most people thought that, that because I wrote the book, uh, his name is still Mudd, that there was some sort of breach between us. It wasn't. We were very good friends and communicated often. He sent me the copies of the letters that Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter sent him about his grandfather. He lived to be 101. Um, 
and occasionally on Sunday mornings, he would call me on the phone and tell me how wrong I was and uh, would try to convince me, you know, to reverse my view and opinion of his grandfather. But but always cordial. We were always we were always good friends. I'm rambling like Bert rambles on the tape. Well, I I consider 1950 sort of the modern Lincoln group uh, because uh, for the first time the Lincoln group elected officers had a slate of officers, and of course they elected Bert uh, as their first president at 5051. And now they had a slate of officers, they had regular monthly meetings, they always had a speaker. So this is the Lincoln group that we know. Um, and I, I, I kind of separate pre-50 from 50. Uh, so I want to jump forward to Fred Schwengel, uh, who was president from 1958 to 60. That's an important date. Fred was a member of the House of Representatives from Iowa. Uh, 10 years, five terms, he served from 55 to 65. He ran for re-election in 65, was defeated, but came back in 67 and was elected for three more terms. So he, he served eight terms as a Republican from Iowa. Um, in 62, Fred formed the Capitol Historical Society. And to the best of my knowledge, he remained president until he died in 93, uh, about positive about that. Maybe someone out there can correct me. But as you see, President Eisenhower appointed Fred chairman of the Lincoln Sesquicentennial, the 150th birthday of Lincoln. Uh, and Fred, of course, is president of the Lincoln Group at this time. And he was the, clearly should have been appointed chairman of the Lincoln Sesquicentennial. He's quite a Lincoln scholar in his own right. Um, and as a member of the House, he was able to get a fair amount of money appropriated to support the sesquicentennial. And I have to say, and it's just my opinion, I, I was on the advisory board for the bicentennial, and I was on the board of West Virginia's bicentennial. And I think Fred and the sesquicentennial really outdid the bicentennial, surprising as that is. One of the things Fred did was he organized a reenactment of the first inaugural on the Eastern steps of the Capitol. It's a very, very big event, went over quite well. He had Aaron Copeland come in with Lincoln portrait. And um, one of the big events was he invited Carl Sandburg to address uh, a joint session of the Congress, which was a really big deal. Um, this picture you should have in your archives. Um, it's misdated. This, this, this is 1960. This, this is our banquet, our Lincoln Group banquet in 1959. The reason I say that is here's Fred at the podium president, but here is Carl Sandburg, who was the speaker at the Lincoln Group for the 59 banquet. And he's in town, of course, to address the joint session of Congress. Um, and here he is making his famous, famous address to the joint session, uh, Vice President Nixon, who obviously is listening very intently, and Sam Rayburn, Speaker of the House. Carl, Sam, I have several tapes of Sam Burn, and he, he just has this mesmerizing voice um, uh, reading from his own books and, and or any of his speeches about Lincoln is, is just, just mesmerizing. So I thought I would just play a clip for you uh, unfortunately, it's a little low volume because if I turned up the volume, it becomes distorted. So if you lean towards your computers and hopefully this doesn't require any special manipulation on your part, but um, I put up the words so you can follow because I know the brain when it hears and can't understand if it sees the words, it can follow clearly. So here's a little clip of Carl Sandburg uh, taken from the speech. To close, we're not enemies but friends. We must not be enemies. For passion may have strong, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memories, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land, will yet. Swell the course of the union and again touch 
as sure they will be by the better angels of our nature. Well, I hope you could hear that. I mean, uh, I can listen to Carl Sandler for hours. Sometimes I do. <laughs> He's the only speaker that can bring a tear to my eye. This is 1962, and for the life of me, I have no idea why it's black tie, uh, but it is. Look, you can see our little banner there. Um, and here is Fred, who's honchoed the affair. And the guest speaker at this banquet was Edward R. Murrow. Um, I've searched this photograph and I just can't identify any, any, anybody in it except two other, three other people. And I, but then it was 60 years ago. So uh, here's Paul Banff who, who succeeds um, Fred Schwengel as president. Uh, but one person I could pick out is this gentleman, it's Gerald Ford. He's the Congressman from Michigan at the time. And if you look at the far left of this picture, there's a gentleman, unfortunately, because it's at the edge of the photograph, he can't make out his features here. But this is a long standing member of the Lincoln Group, Dr. John Washington, uh, the dentist from Washington who wrote the book we all love, They Knew Lincoln. As I said, he was a long standing member of the group, very fine gentleman. I'm going to jump to Josephine Cobb. Uh, 1970 to 71, she was president. She died in 86. Strangely enough, most of the people I'm mentioning here, the old time, they all died in the 1980s. It was a terrible decade for that. Um, Josephine, for those of you who don't know, um, was appointed chief of the still picture section of the National Archives in 1936. She is the first woman to be appointed to any administrative or sectional position in the National Archives. Um, and she, she was in charge of, of uh, the 10,000 glass plates of uh, um, Matthew Brady. And when I started researching there, you know, you could get an eight by 10 print for $2. Uh, you could get a print off a glass negative, a glass plate for $20. Then they upped it to 100, and then, of course, they stopped it because it was too damaging uh, to the plates. Now you can only get it off negatives. Well, Josephine is pointing to a print off of this glass plate, which I'm sure you recognize, most of you. This is the dedication ceremonies at uh, Gettysburg. And Josephine, in 1953, um, hit the national headline. She's on the evening news and newspapers across the country. She got into Newsweek and Time magazine. Um, you know, the, the grain on these plates is so fine that you can blow them up four feet by six feet and lose very little resolution. I mean, I've done this many times with glass plates that I've had at one of my labs at NIH, and it's amazing what you can do. And so Josephine spent a lot of time examining these plates, and she wound up identifying Lincoln at Gettysburg. Uh, she also identified, I believe, B.B. French and Edward Everett and Ward Hill Lehman. And so this is an unknown photograph of Lincoln at one of the most historic times. And uh, so it really made national headlines. Josephine um, put a little bit of glow on the Lincoln group at D.C. Uh, I show you this newspaper clipping because when she retired and went home to Portland, Maine, uh, she was a cemetery person. She did rubbings uh, of tombstones. And I bring this up because there, were, there was a group of us in the Lincoln group who were tombstone people, grave people. Bert was the most famous and um, John Brennan of the Surratt Society and the famous Roger Hunt and myself would tour all the cemeteries in the Washington, Maryland, Virginia area. And whenever we went on the road, like the Lincoln Trail, we always went to the cemeteries. Our purpose was to collect the tombstone graves of every person who had anything at all to do with Abraham Lincoln. And, and uh, my subcategory, of course, was the assassination. And uh, along the way, I had actually accumulated the graves, tombstones of 343 people who had something to do with the Lincoln assassination, one way or another, or the military tribunal and the hanging and uh, put it together in this, in this particular booklet. But I show you this, this is a page from the booklet. This is Charles Ford, who's one of the doctors at the Peterson house. This is John, Frank Ford, who is John Ford's son, and of course, Harry Ford, 
his John Ford's um, brother and treasurer. But I show it to you because of this tombstone of Charles Forbes. Forbes was the uh, messenger and valet of Lincoln. He was the fellow that sat uh, at the end row seat A closest to the outer door to the box at Forbes. He's the guy that Booth encountered, had a conversation with. Booth gave him a card of some sort and Forbes waved him into the box and you know what happens. Well, <clears throat> James O. Hall, who many of you know of, I'm sure, the Dean of Lincoln Assassination Scholars, uh, in his research discovered the unmarked grave of Charles Forbes and his wife, Margaret. And we were chatting one day and he said, you know, we ought to, we ought to mark that grave, put a tombstone on it. And I said, that would be a great project for the Lincoln Group. So we passed the hat, raised money, uh, and had this tombstone made and uh, put on Charles Forbes' grave. And you can see here the Lincoln Group of Washington, 1983. This was kind of a big event. A lot of people turned out. And Steve Carson, who would become president of the Lincoln Group, had a great idea. He went and invited the Irish ambassador to the United States, who came to this event. And, uh, and because Charles Ford was born in Ireland and emigrated to the United States. So the Irish ambassador said some nice words about Irishmen coming to the state. He, he spoke more about Lieutenant Edward Doherty uh, than he did about Charles Ford. Doherty is the guy that led the 16th New York Cavalry that chased down Booth. But it was quite an event. Um, and so it's another feather in the cap of um, the Lincoln Group of DC. Now look at all that verbiage. Um, uh, Hall wrote that, and I, and I said to him, I said, you know, that's an awful lot of words to put on a tombstone. He said, you're right, but he said, when anybody goes to congressional and they see that, they're going to go over and read it, and that's the important point, and I said, bingo, uh, you got it, so Hall was right. This is Percy Powell, another fine gentleman of the Lincoln Group. Percy worked at the Library of Congress. He was president from 56 to 57. Um, Percy had the unique honor of um, being given the job of indexing and collating all of Lincoln's papers and speeches. You know that Robert Todd Lincoln donated all those papers to the Library of Congress with the stipulation that they could not be made public until 21 years after Robert Lincoln's death. 21's an odd number. Percy didn't know why 21. I tried hard to find out why 21. Maybe one of you know why 21. You'd think it'd be 20 years or 25 years. In any event, um, Robert Lincoln died July 26, 1926. And so one minute past midnight on July the 26th, 1947, Percy threw the doors open and hordes of historians went in where Percy had laid out all the albums where he had collated and indexed the papers and everybody worked very hard till dawn's early light. So that's another feather, I think, in the cap. And here's a, uh, it's kind of ratty picture because it's clipped out of a newspaper. Per Percy's kneeling in front of one of the two vaults where he kept, you see these volumes where he's arranging and collating all of the Lincoln, Lincoln papers. Percy had one other, interesting uh, uh, job that he did on behalf of the Lincoln Group. Carl Schenck was the editor, I think he was, the editor of volume one and two, um, and was getting ready to do volume three when Percy Powell said, well, the Lincoln Group of DC has already been doing this. They, they've already been collecting uh, the material for 61 and 65. So Schenck then appointed Percy uh, editor for volume three and the Lincoln Group of DC compiled volume three of uh, Lincoln Day by Day. Another feather in our cap. If you read the preface, which most people don't, uh, to the volume, uh, third volume, uh, Percy um, lists all the Lincoln Group members that participated in compiling this. So there's Josh, great old Josh Billings, Joseph, uh, Josephine Cobb, Anna Hausman, George Landes, uh, Wayne Temple. Wayne Temple was a member of the group, although 
during my stay, he only got, we invited him to give a talk. He only came once. Now, this is the National Cathedral. Of course, you all recognize it. I suppose many of you have been there. If you go in the front door and immediately to your right is the Washington Bay dedicated to George Washington. And if you go to your left is the Lincoln Bay dedicated to Abraham Lincoln, the founder of the country, the savior of the country. And this is the Lincoln Bay. That's the wonderful statue by uh, Walt, Walter Hancock. I, I, one of you mentioned monuments men. Walter was a monuments man. He, he was part of that very unusual and brave cadre of uh, of curators that uh, were sent to Europe during World War II under Eisenhower to do everything they could to protect art treasures and architectural structures and what have you from being used by the military that would result in their destruction or damage. And um, uh, Walker was, was among those. Th these people, I know they made a movie, which I thought was a terrible movie. I, I had written a, a chapter in one of my books on the Monuments Men before the movie came out. The movie does them no justice at all. This is an extraordinary group of, a group of people that did this. Well, uh, the reason I bring this up is you see the tableau in the background and you recognize what's up there. It's the farewell speech at Springfield. Um, at the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church, they had a Lincoln Advisory Committee. And I, I think they have it today. Um, there. Um, I was on the advisory committee for several years, uh, and I, I don't know, there may have been 12 or 15 people on it, of which eight probably were members of the Lincoln group. Well, George Dougherty was pastor at the church, and he was about to retire, and Arthur McKay was going to step in, take his place, and someone or some, some group came to Dougherty and said, uh, could they, could, could the church recommend uh, something for that tableau? And so uh, Doherty turned it over to McKay, and McKay turned it over to the Lincoln Advisory Committee. And of course, it was a no-brainer. Um, it, it's just perfect. Uh, uh, couldn't have been a better choice uh, to put up there Lincoln's farewell speech. It, it satisfies so many criteria um, to, be, to be in the Lincoln Bay. But once again, it's another feather in the cap of the Lincoln Group of DC. Well, this is the tape that I showed you in the beginning. And what I would like to do at this point is just, just let you hear a little bit of Bert. I'd like to bring, bring him back if I can. <laughs> He's such a, such, such a good friend. Um, so this is a little loud. Maybe you want to turn down your computer or lean back. But here's just, just a few minutes of Bert. Uh, I'd like for you all to hear him. I can't be sure because I don't know. But uh, now that you've asked for the history of the origin of the Lincoln Group, after having read those articles, I mean, the review about those various organizations, the thought hit me one day, well, why couldn't we have a Lincoln Group here in Washington, D.C.? So I went around to uh, the Paul Thomas bookstore on G Street, quite near the old uh, uh, YMCA building, which is no longer there, between the 17th and 18th. And I said to Paul Perl, I said, who buys your Lincoln books? He says, Dr. Wilson of uh, Agriculture. And as in Milburn, M-I-L-B-U-R-N, and Milburn Lincoln Wilson. And I said, well, tell me something about him. You know, he said, well, he said he's from out west somewhere. And he's the undersecretary of agriculture. And he knew Wilson from someplace, I don't know where, someplace where Wilson was on the program and uh, uh, Governor Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt of New York was on the same program having to do with food or some such. And uh, when, when Roosevelt got in the White House, he uh, appointed, I think, uh, wasn't uh, Wallace the secretary of agriculture at the time? I think he was. I'm not sure about that. And uh, they made M.L. Wilson the assistant secretary. So I sent Wilson a telegram saying that I was interested in starting a Lincoln group. And uh, instead of writing me, his secretary, Ms. Spalding, Ms. Spalding called me and she said, uh, Dr. Wilson wants to see you. He wants you to come down. He wants to talk with you. So I went down. I was very pleased, of course, that the 
and uh, he was most gracious. He's just as common on a plane as the old shoe. Uh, he, he's deceased now. He died over there on Connecticut Avenue in that apartment house. I would have went up and picked up everything he had and cleaned up and mess up. And uh, his, 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 his uh, things were kind of screwing around and not very well. Quite a job. But anyway. Well, that's a little taste of Bert. Uh, uh, and so uh, you can see I did tell you uh, accurately <laughs> the formation of the, of the Lincoln Group. I know in your directories and, and uh, you list 1935, but uh, Bert agrees that it's 1934 because M.L. Wilson, while he was in 33 in the administration, he was on some minor committee. He wasn't appointed undersecretary until 1934. So um, we think that the official start date is, is 1934. Now, uh, and, and finishing up, I want to throw this in as a little teaser because both Susan Dennis and David Kent mentioned at the end of the write-up uh, on, on tonight that uh, Joan and I, Joan Chaconis and I had gotten into the Lincoln Vault, the Osborne Oldroyd collection. Uh, this, this is year 1980. Mike Harmon was the uh, Park Service uh, ranger who was in charge of it. It was stored in old Union Station under terrible conditions. And uh, so Joan and I, um, we knew Mike quite well. He, uh, we set up to go over there and photograph items. I had to take a camera, camera stand and photographed over 500 items in that collection. Um, so, uh, and so I show you this because that same year, 1980, Joan and I did two other things that were quite unusual, I think. One involved the Brady studio uh, at the time. And what most people don't know is that Joan's family owned the Brady studios. Uh, Pete Chaconis, her husband, had a restaurant there, uh, the Kansas City Steakhouse. So we did some interesting, found some interesting things there. And the other was we located an unknown statue of Abraham Lincoln, um, which had a marvelous story associated with it and it's still unknown. Uh, and so I thought hopefully someday if someone cancels a talk or you could fit in, I would just love to tell you about those three events in 1980 because they all took place in Washington, D.C. at places you're quite familiar with, and I think you probably would get a kick out of it and enjoy it. Anyway, that's all, folks. Um, obviously, I left out more than I included, <laughs> but uh, time, of course, doesn't allow. So, David or John, I turn it back to you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might okay. have. So there, there obviously can be a part two, maybe a part three. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, so if, if anybody has any thoughts they want to add or questions for Ed or whatever, uh, open up your go ahead and open up your mic and and offer them and then close your mic when you're not talking so that we don't get too much noise. We'll, we'll see how that David, works. Yeah, okay. I, I, I put this in the chat already, but Bob Bob O'Connor has knows some of Lemons or Layman's living descendants and they they call themselves Lemon. That's how come Bob uses the term lemon when he portrays him because of the living descendants even though maybe they 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 changed it and and i i thought it was very cool about helen helen lil harper harold holzer also knew helen lil harper from the from new york so i now know two people you know i talk about dr leal so i now know two people who that's my connection who know knew uh, leal's granddaughter very cool. <laughs> well, John, John, she, she would come to maybe two meetings and she'd come down and I would pick her up at Union Station and bring her or George Landy's would if I was involved in doing something else. And she she gave me uh, an autographed uh, pamphlet of um, Charles Leal's talk to the Military Order of the Loyal Legion. And that, yeah. that pamphlet should be in Lincoln's your, Last Hours, it's called. Yeah, Lincoln's Last Hours autograph. That should be in your archives. Yeah. yeah there, I, there's, I have a picture of her standing at her grandfather's grave up there in New York. <laughs> yeah, really good. 
<laughs> but I have a picture of me sitting next to her at a Lincoln Group meeting. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, hey, Ed, can yeah. you uh, stop your screen share? Oh, how do I do that? Uh, <clears throat> Just go to screen share at the oh, top. Oh, I see. I got you. Stop. Hold on. <clears throat> Let me get my cursor up there. Oh, good. Okay. There we go. I hope we have. Yes, that's good. Okay, good, good. Well, the, the one thing I feel a little bit badly about is George Landy's. I, I, um, I, he's a hero to me of the Lincoln Group, and I didn't put in about George, talk about him. I just felt I couldn't fit it in. But um, I, I indicated we met at lunch, and uh, the, the group is really fading. Uh, I mean, th there were certain lunch meetings where we were down to like 15, 16 people. And I think, I mean, there was Joan Chacona, Steve Carson, George and myself, everybody else was over 75. The average age of the group must have been 80. And, um, but George was holding it together uh, as best he could. And, um, we talked and the only solution was going to evening meetings, but George was closely tied to all of these people. And he said, I can't do that because they won't drive into Washington or go to meetings at night. Um, and we're gonna lose them all. And, and um, but he said, you, you could do it. You know, you're new to the group. Um, and so I did. Uh, and if Joan Chaconis is out there, uh, Joan who knows everybody, uh, was knew the woman who was the manager of the officers club at Fort McNair. So Joan went to see her and she said, we'd be delighted to have you. So we moved from lunch to evening. And I said, look, once you get through that, that gate, you can't be in a more secure place in Washington than Fort McNair. <laughs> and the parking lot, as you all well know, is just a few feet away from the door in, into the officers mess. And so it worked, um, you know, we had to pick up these people uh, and drive them there and drive them on. I should bring Bert and Edna Miller, wonderful story about her, um, to, to the club. And we, we finally wound up with about 150 members. The banquet, the, the 83 banquet was uh, over 250 people. So, so it, it worked and that's how we went. That's how we went to evening. There, there was some- yeah, We gotta get back to that number. Um, before I go, there's a couple of people that have a hand up and want to ask questions. Before I go to you guys, though, can I, uh, Michelle, can you put up that picture that you had? Just you want to go that. ahead and, and let the folks ask their questions and we can do it after the Q&A? Or do you want me to do it now? Uh, you can do it now if you want. If you don't, then I'll go to questions. <laughs> okay, I'll just, I'll just do this really quickly. And if you're, if you happen to be looking at the photo of me with my, you know, for this, for the screen, that's actually the Abraham Lincoln papers behind me. So you're actually seeing what C. Percy Powell was, was looking at. So let me share my screen. All right. Can you see it? Okay. There oh, and there's Percy. <laughs> yeah. So this is about three in the morning on the day that the Lincoln Papers opened in July of 1947. And they had a, as they had a celebration for um, some of the library staff and for Lincoln scholars before it opened to the public. And so for those of you who might have been in the Jefferson building, I believe this is probably what we call Mahogany Row, which is that kind of LJ 119, 13 area where we do a lot of public events and library oh, yeah, things behind. Yeah, I know the room. But so these are some of the Lincoln <laughs> papers here on, on a cart and a couple of them sitting here. And and I love to show this picture because I say, can you spot all the things we don't do anymore? We no. do not have cups of coffee when we're sitting with the Lincoln papers. Um, we do not have bottles of alcohol as much as we might like to. And we <laughs> definitely do not smoke cigarettes next to the Lincoln papers. But um, so this is this is my hero, C. Percy Powell here. And uh, this was Robert Lincoln's papers open to the public. Yeah, that's what that is. And then this is librarian of Congress, Luther Evans at the, at the time. So wow, anyway, so wonderful the, picture, wonderful. Yeah, yeah we, we love showing this picture, particularly to archivists because we, we just all lose our minds with all the stuff that they're not supposed to be doing. Well, can you imagine getting into the Olroyd collection? 
<laughs> photographing over 500 items. Yeah. I mean, it just, there's no way that would happen. And okay, let's let's go to, we have a couple people want to ask questions, so I'm going to go to them. So Kurt, would you ask yours first, and then we'll go to Edgar. Uh, sure. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hey, okay. <laughs> and that's, that was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. But, uh, I've been responsible for uh, doing the history in our organization. I don't think we have anybody in our organization quite like you that's done that could do such a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I didn't realize Bert Sheldon was uh, so um, important to your group. He actually was a founding member of our group as well, the Civil War Roundtable of the District yes. of Columbia. Yep. And we have posted on our website. Our newsletter is going back to 1951. They're available to the public. And I will take a look to see if we have any photos of, of Bert. Oh, please. Oh. Uh, we also have some recordings of uh, our round table, but also the Sh Chicago Civil War round table. And I'll check to see if we have any recordings of him that might be able to um, assist you with hearing his voice a little bit. Um, is, have you digitized that audio recording? I have not. Um, <laughs> okay. The only way I'll digitize it, the, the, the part I played to you, uh, I, I record it on my computer. Um, okay. And, well, maybe we can help you with that too, because uh, <laughs> we have been doing some digitizing of Excellent. documents as well as audio, but uh, that well, was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, and absolutely would. I, I listen. Uh, I, I used to attend your meetings too back, back then. Ulysses S. Grant, the third, was a member along with William Howard Taft, the fourth, uh, the great grandson, great grand, yeah, the great grandson of William Howard Taft and the grandson of Ulysses S. Grant. Yeah, there don't, was. Don't forget, famous... don't forget Bruce Catton either. Oh well, Bruce Catton, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he, he came to a couple of armies and, um, well, I, I can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. And, and by the way, uh, specifically, we have some of our yearbooks and our yearbooks identify who were the members as well as some photographs. So I will see if we have one of Bert Sheldon, but uh, I would think that maybe the police department might have a photo of him too. I never thought of that, you know. Uh, this is what's very disturbing to me. Uh, I'm getting to the point now, I can hear Bert, but I can't see his face anymore. And it, it's, it kind of bothers me, you know, because um, Bert, Bert and I were great friends. Bert, as I said, was he's a great cemetery guy. And I have tape recordings of us going through Congressional Cemetery from grave to grave, and Bert is doing his narration. He'd call me up at work and say, Ed, can you get off this afternoon? And I'd say, what's up? And he'd say, well, John Brennan and I want to go to Rock Creek or we want to go to Oak Hill. And so I would pick him up and we'd go through the cemetery and Bert would do his narration on all the famous graves. Um, yeah. He was quite a guy. He, 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 yeah. That's Lincoln great to have had that. a lot of interesting people in it. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. To, that's why I want to try to capture this, this history. Um, Edgar, you had a you have a, a question, and then Bob Willer. Thank you. Yes. Well, first, I uh, this is Edgar Russell. I for those who are newer members, I was a uh, president of the Lincoln Group during the bicentennial, and I want to echo Kurt's uh, commendation to you, Ed, for a wonderful presentation. Oh, thank my you. My questions are, or my comment first is. It's wonderful that you have these recordings, and I'm delighted that someone threw the switch to record this meeting tonight. But my other question is, have you written down everything that you have in your brain, Ed? Because I think we need to have a, a biography of the Lincoln Group written, and we want to get it now. So that, that's my question to you, Ed. No, I haven't. And um, uh, uh, but you have the tape and you have the Lincolnians. Uh, I do have a lot of anecdotes that that aren't in those um, uh, that I did want to win, that I did. You know, we had four members of the group that had very significant World War Two experiences. Um, at, uh, uh, George Landis, um, Josh Billings, Ed Bars, and Edna Miller. 
And I, I had wanted to include that Edna, Ed, wonderful Edna Miller. She spent four years in a Japanese concentration camp. And what struck me about her was she could tell you she spent exactly 1,192 days in a Japanese concentration camp. And so she had wonderful stories to tell about that during World War II. I mean, what a unique experience. No, so, but I mean, boy, I don't know, uh, writing all that down. Um, well, well, maybe we could do the same as you did for Bert. Maybe one of our technical experts can, can meet you and uh, just let you talk for about 10 hours uh, over uh, <laughs> lunch and drinks. And we would have all this down for the next yes. generation. Yes, Ed. Ed. Ed, you need a private archivist. <laughs> yeah. Colonel Russell, let me also suggest that we have a number of uh, members who have been associated with us for a long time, and including good representation of past presidents tonight. And it would be a worthwhile project to get a brief note, for, well, a lengthy note. Uh, anybody who has uh, held the position in the past, let's start to collate this information before we lose it all. I'm looking well, at Miles, Willard. I'm looking at you, Charlie. I'm looking at you, Karen. <laughs> well, there's Bob Willard. I mean, Bob, Bob Willard. <laughs> I mean, I remember Bob Willard back then. He certainly was, was one of the old timers. <laughs> so your help would be appreciated if you can find the time to make some notes on your experience and memories of the group. Uh, that'd be great. We'll collate all this. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's something that... Uh, You've been looking at doing and and Ed doing this as part of that process of a you know doing doing an old time oral history type of thing and trying to capture all of this information. I mean, this the stuff we just don't you know those of us well, who haven't been in the group for as long as as Ed and and some of the other members. Like John said, there are plenty of of, of past presidents. Um, on the call, and even if you weren't a president, that if you've been with a firm with the uh, with the group for a long time, you have information that newer people don't know, and we want to be able to capture that. Um, so, with that in mind, I want to give Bob Willard a chance to to talk because Bob has been with this group for a very long time as well. Yes, one of one of the best bargains I ever uh, got was. Uh, signing up for life membership back in the 80s. Ah. Uh, and I think Ed was president at the time. Um, Wouldn't pay me I now. Like to, <laughs> I just like to reminisce a bit about uh, Fred Schweiker. Um, he, he certainly was a mover and shaker for the Lincoln world during the both the sesquicentennial of Lincoln's birth and the centennial of Lincoln's administration. Oh, and the Civil War. Um, that I remember watching on television the Sandberg speech uh, on, in 59. And I bet you uh, there's no one else on the call who could say, who could claim attending a Lincoln event any earlier than my uh, attending the March 4th, 1961 reenactment of the first inaugural. That's mm -hmm. the day I. Uh, was escorted out onto the steps by Senator Dirksen, who I didn't have a ticket, but I ran into him and he, he, he let me go out on the steps of the Capitol and watch the thing. And then as I'm standing there, not knowing what the whole program was, out walks Carl Sandburg. So that was just, uh, I, I mean, I get, I get goosebumps now thinking about mm. that day. And I, I did go up and talk to Sandberg and walked with him from the front steps of the Capitol to the back of the, the Library of Congress, where his daughter had parked their car. But Schweiker, uh, the congressman, the honorable, uh, also um, had a celebration for the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation. And yeah. it was a concert down in the uh, old um, uh, Watergate uh, the floating band show near the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, the, and he also had a, a reenactment of the second inaugural, which I know has been filmed and I have tracked down that film. It is in the University of Wisconsin Historical Society or yeah, the Wisconsin Historical Society at the University of Wisconsin. And they have a, a very poor copy of it. So uh, very, mostly what they call magenta tinted 
but uh, I've had some conversations about making getting that available. Hadley Stevenson was the narrator at the uh, second inaugural reenactment. Um, the other thing that I th Fred obviously has something to do with this is the uh, the Edward R. Murrow presentation that you mentioned. Uh, um, that the the an audio recording of that speech is available on the internet at the JFK Library, and I just listened to it recently. He was uh, talking about the emerging African states and comparing the the problems they would face to the problems Lincoln faced in in establishing himself. Um, so that that uh, address is available, and I'll I'll put a, a link to it in in the chat after I finish yakking. The one other thing I just want to show is this is out of my collection. That's the 1959-60 Lincoln Group directory. And it has in it, uh, well, it lists the 384 members at that time. And it also has a number of the uh, events that were um, celebrated by the, uh, by the uh, group. Um, so that's uh, when uh, Ed called me an old timer, there was no way I could uh, dispute that. I've been around a while. <laughs> Uh, Bob, can you make a photocopy of that directory? I'll scan it. Okay, if you would email it, that'd be great. That's uh, thank you. More fodder for future meetings. <laughs> if anybody else has anything uh, like that, I'm uh, surprised no one brought up Paul Simon, uh, senator from Illinois, who was a member of the Lincoln Group of DC. Um, but Paul didn't attend meetings, but he did one thing, uh, at least for two years, he invited us up to the Capitol where he hosted a luncheon for the Lincoln Group of DC. And uh, I, I can remember that it was in a private room and I have no idea what they probably served us Navy bean soup, but uh, Paul would have had us up there twice uh, to have our meeting, have our meeting. Fine gentlemen, yeah. yeah. Speaking of all of these old, uh, politicians that were heavily involved, including being president of, of the group. Uh, there was another guy or a couple other guys that, uh, that at least had incidents with the group uh, in Ronald Reagan and, mm. and, and Richard Nixon. Mm. Mm. I know Richard Nixon was a, was a member when he was vice president. I don't know if he ever came to, to meetings. And then you have uh, an anecdote about uh, Ronald Reagan. I left that out because I just didn't feel I had enough time uh, to include it. Um, um, uh, you want me, I can just, I guess, describe it or, or mention it. Um, if you'd like. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, we just got a couple of people raising their hands. So why don't we grab that? Yeah, go, go, let, go to the audience. Because I, I also want, to, to try to talk you into doing another one of these things too. Um, Charlie Doty, why don't you uh, jump in? Yeah, hi, how are you? Yeah, I was the president in the early 2000s. I don't remember, right before Edgar. <clears throat> and little bits and pieces, you had to commit for six years, uh, second vice president, first vice president, and then two years as the, the president, where you hoped everyone else was doing their job <clears throat> because you'd show up to the meeting and hope <clears throat> things were all set up to go. Uh, my first meeting was in, in 1986. I was invited by Steve Carson. You cannot forget Steve. He was a critical part of the Lincoln Group. And he, uh, <clears throat> and he invited me. <clears throat> and you would, as a first new member, you would sit in the front where all the officers were. And of course, the Honorable Fred Schwengel, which is the way you had to refer to him. You know, uh, everyone called him that. I noticed that uh, Ed called him Fred. <laughs> that he, they must have known him. The Honorable, and you would sit. You would be brought to sit right next to the Honorable Fred Schwengel. And he talked to you, he was very pleasant, very nice. And you, he expect you to talk to him too. So you were on your best behavior, you know? And then afterwards, after you were up there as a new member, uh, 
he said at the end of the meeting, we got to sign you up. So I thought that I passed, I, I, I made it through the Honorable Fred Schwengel, because I don't know if he said that every single time uh, after he's checking you out. So you had to go through a certain amount of tension uh, there. Um, we had some important people. I was there when Paul Simon was there. I sat next to Senator Dick Durbin when he was there. He came with all his uh, all his bodyguards and so on. So there was a lot of uh, excitement going on there. The the representative from Lincoln's uh, uh, Congress said he did not want to come. He said there was conflict of interest, so he refused to come to the Lincoln Group. Um, and one last thing, we met. 10 times a year. We had 10 speakers, we had an auction, we had a field trip. So it was a very dynamic group. We didn't meet quarterly or, or semi-annually. We met 10 times. So when you committed to be part of that, uh, uh, to be one of the officers, you gave an awful lot because 10 meetings every year. So uh, little bits and pieces of the old days. We, we are, our group is by far the most active Lincoln group. Uh, most Lincoln groups, um, like Boston, I think they're two or three times a year, and New York is two or three times a year. Um, in New Jersey, it's once a year. ALA is once a year. The Lincoln Forum is once a year. Lincoln Institute is once a year. So as, as a Lincoln group, um, we are we are by far the most active Lincoln group. And as, as Charlie mentioned, that, that's been true for a very long time. Um, there have been some times when it's maybe not as busy, not as active as others, as you tend to get that. Sometimes depends on who the people are and situations and things like that. But for the most part, since we started, we've been an incredibly active group um, and something that everybody in the group now and, and over time certainly should, should uh, feel proud of. Um, Bob Willard, your, your hand is up. Are you just still up or do you have something else you wanna add? Um, I think, okay, yes. Uh, I do wanna, I do want to, um, first of all, I think as an old timer, I misstated Congressman Schwengel's name uh, I might have referred to another congressman by the name of Schweiker, but uh, I do know it's Schwengel. And in fact, I wanted to uh, mention that uh, the congressman's papers are in a very well-developed collection at Truman State University in Missouri, I guess, um, or is it Iowa, um, where, he, um, where he went to school. But his papers have been very well indexed. And I went and visited the library once and found uh, all sorts of interesting papers having to do deal with the Lincoln group. That's all. This is John Swallow. I have a contextual question. I mean, which, as impressed as I've been as part of this group, I mean, it's three or five times greater. I mean, we. Uh, uh, in our, all of our history, but this is the nation's capital. Are there other groups devoted to studying, researching, discussing other presidents? Adams, Washington, Jefferson, uh, FDR, uh, Eisenhower, uh, Grant, is there? Uh, well, I, I suspect there are. I mean, I'm not a member of any of them because I don't have time to study more than one president. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the, I'm sure there are other groups. Uh, now, I suspect there are not too many uh, uh, Herbert Hoover groups <laughs> um, or some of the others, but uh, I'm sure they each, each president has his following. And certainly, there are going to be researchers. Yeah, there's a that, large group of, of grant followers. The Grant Memorial Grant Association. Grant, yeah. Grant. Grant. There is the Teddy Roosevelt Association in New York. Yeah, there's plenty of when you when you name the big presidents that everybody can remember when they go through the president list, the ones that everybody remembers, they all have 
groups that follow them. And Grant is one of the bigger ones. Um, I don't know about some of the smaller ones, but I'm sure there are because there are people who do research on those time and time areas. And there's hardly a time in our history when something important didn't happen. And somebody was president during that time. So at the very least by, by uh, temporarily, you're going to get um, you're going to get those presidents, but we're focused on the, on Lincoln, and right. because it's the 200th anniversary of Ulysses S. Grant, uh, Grant's birth, we the our study forum is is reading about Ulysses S. Grant, um, which obviously gives more insight into Abraham Lincoln than Herbert Hoover might, you know, um, so. We still have uh, we still have time. I mean, people have anything uh, anything else they want to either ask Ed or or add in. Well, Ed, I'll I'll throw one more thing in about the assassination that doc, Dr. Mudd was also a member of our Society of Civil War Surgeons group too, and and um, of course you know his daughter also Mary McHale. She's still around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, of course, we had an up and down relationship with Louise Mud Earhart, who, who, who ran the Mud House. I used to do, I did a lot of booth escape route tours, probably about 50 in my lifetime. And at one point, she banned me from the property. Well, was she, she, wasn't she the one who wouldn't let James O. Hall on there either? No, no, she wouldn't let me off the bus. It's very famous. She didn't like James O. Hall either. Well, she never banned him. Of course not. She never banned him, but uh, we, then, then, you know, she changed and allowed me off the bus, but it, it was always a great. <laughs> Last time I did a booth tour was not too long ago. I came out of retirement, and, and this time all the docents came outside and wanted to have their picture taken with me. And I tell that. That's how things have changed <laughs> at the mud house um, from, from the beginning. Um, but Richard Mudd is quite different. And he didn't get, a, well, I won't say it. Um, <clears throat> yeah. two, two and a half decades ago, I'd go by the mud house a lot and just never decided, you know, I was independent. My, and I, I, this is John Swallow. I, I never had the good sense to take an hour and go in and see it. Yeah. I, I Wyatt, who was a from Mud Mud and whatever uh, a law firm in La Plata, Maryland. But uh, anyway, that was before I knew we had a Lincoln Group. When I was a hospital administrator in Maryland, the uh, granddaughter of Dr. Mud was a volunteer at my hospital at the age of ninety-five. Uh, but she would re regale us with stories of sleeping in the, the booth bedroom in the Mud House. Mm. Oh. <clears throat> Hey, Ed, you mentioned that the Lincolnian newsletter stopped for a while. What were the dates that it, it stopped? Do you know? What were the what? The dates that the Lincolnian newsletter was in the 50s. wasn't being published? It was in the 50s, I think, that it stopped. And I know George Landis had a, had a set of them, and I don't know what happened to it. Uh, of course, George, George died in 1984. And so that's a long time ago. I, I don't know what happened to the copies that he had. So you, when you got it started again, or when it started up again, that was 1984, is that what you said? 1982. 82. Yeah, in February, no, September, October, 82 was the first issue that I started up again. And in those days, it was all cut and paste, you know? I mean, obviously we didn't have, we didn't have computers and, what have you so um yeah around that that time i was doing a newsletter for my college mm. it was it was mimeographed to run it well I, one of the things one of the things we did was put a put a swatch of the wallpaper from the box in one of the lincolnians um as a sort of interesting little gimmick um something joan joan jaconis and i did we found out who did the reproduction work for ford's theater and um it was a small little private company i think on fourth street that did the wallpaper and so we went around to see them and um it turned out uh, 
uh, it was called Assam, the Assam uh, Wallpaper Company. It turned out that they had several rolls of the wallpaper left over. So I asked if I could buy them and the guy said, sure, why not? So he sold me two rolls of wallpaper they used to, uh, that were used in the box, the reproduction wallpaper. So I, George and I decided to cut out swatches and paste them in the Lincolnium so that every, every member got a piece of the reproduction wallpaper from a Ford. <laughs> We got in a lot of things. Boy, we got in a lot of things. I mean, I, I guess 9-11 changed so many things in this country, things that we did. You know, when we got into in the Lincoln vault, Mike Harmon, I was photographing the play. And he came to me and he said, Ed, I, I got an appointment at lunch. I, I have to go out to meet someone at lunch. I said, Mike, we, I, we, I'm, we're all set up here. We're done. He said, no, 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 no. You and Joan can stay. You just keep working on something. <laughs> he said, I'll probably be back around two o'clock. And off he went. And there we sat with the Polaroid collection photographing it. And my car was parked right outside. I could look in the window and see it down there. <laughs> I could have loaded the trunk up with the Polaroid collection. <laughs> crazy thing crazy things we did that uh, you could never do today <laughs> like smoking in the national archives with a cup of coffee library of congress come on well, i'm sorry right library of congress yes. thank you <laughs> oh my yes oh boy <clears throat> Anyone have any other insights or questions? I, I, or? I do. Go ahead. I'd love to ask, was there ever any um, uh, energy, any uh, involvement to get younger people involved? I, I just remember that I was really interested in Lincoln beginning in elementary school. And so I just wondered, were there any adjunct efforts to involve younger people? I'm going to mute, mute because we're going to be a fault. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, our efforts to involve younger people were people in their 20s. <laughs> <laughs> because really, the, the Lincoln group at one point had to average at least 75 and not 78 years. And uh, it was kind of dying. But no, I uh, there was certainly no... I, I just mentioned more recently, uh, I, when I was president, uh, uh, was in touch with the social sciences department in the D.C. public schools. Uh, they're happy to take any information you want to give them, but uh, there's not much energy for supporting any outreach with organizations with a focus like ours. So that was an issue. I've also made the rounds of several colleges in D.C., of some of them have programs. American University has a uh, has a Lincoln Center. Uh, they're so involved in their own activities that it doesn't really extend to getting uh, those uh, students uh, involved. So that's that. But that's one effort of area that uh, uh, that yeah. we tried to expand oh, membership. I got, yeah, I got involved when somebody stuck a flyer in my hand. I was going, I used to go down to the Smithsonian uh, building for evening classes related to the Civil War. I'd never heard of the Lincoln Group. And somebody stuck a flyer in my hand, and I think everybody was getting flyers stuck in their hands uh, at that time. And um, I said, well, this looks like an interesting way to spend a Thursday or a Tuesday evening. And, uh, and I went, and it was great. I loved it. Mm. But it's pure happenstance. Sure. Yeah. Well, to paraphrase remember. someone, you can't join a group that you've never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, remember our first uh, inaugural reenactment where we had uh, Sam Waterston give the inauguration up at the Capitol Hill Visitor Center, and we had Civil War reenactors that were between the columns protecting the president while he was being sworn in. And then we all headed over to the Willard Hotel, and we had the Children's Choir sing Battle Hymn of the Republic. And I'll never forget Sam Waterston just sitting there glowing as those kids were singing that song. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. One other thing I'd like to mention, uh, the Lincoln group was early on getting uh, 
of women speakers and minority speakers. When I was president, we had many women speakers and minority speakers. So we were early on with that. We also have had women presidents of the Lincoln Group, as well as the minority president Aaron. of the Lincoln Group. <laughs> so early on, we were doing that. Uh, and there are a lot more women now than even when I was a president, I was still able to find them. So uh, uh, the Lincoln Group has always been uh, early on with so many things that you just don't find in other Lincoln Groups. Uh -huh. uh, you, you, even now, the Lincoln groups now, you'd be lucky to see a woman or a minority. But yeah. we were, and we were getting speakers to come too. And we did that decades and decades ago. So that's another important thing to think about the Lincoln group with DC. Yep. We had our Dakota War of 1862 symposium in the basement of the uh, DC Public Library. Uh, had people from Minnesota that came in and talked about it. And yeah. Well, one of the things that we had uh, uh, in the days of the 80s, I'd say, was we tried to reach younger students. And we actually did for a while have like a little contest, if uh, you recall, maybe Ed, you recall, or Charlie. And uh, we would select, uh, we selected a student that had prepared a paper on Lincoln. And he and his family came to the dinner. Remember that? And uh, that was his, and I think we gave him uh, like a small, um, you know, monetary award for his essay. And we were really trying to do that. Wendy Swanson was very involved in that as well. So we were trying to reach elementary school students at one point. So, that, so there has been some things done in the past, and um, I'm not sure that we're doing much at the moment. Um, we are, I think, one of the things that has come out of this Lincoln Memorial uh, Centennial um, because we have been involved and in large part because we now have uh, a, a website that has a, a blog component to it. So there's more news items that come up more often um, outside of what we do as a group. <clears throat> that is a, it seems to have attracted a lot of attention. So we have heard from a lot of <clears throat> other groups, some of whom we have worked with in the past and collaborated with in the past and, and some that, that may be new. Um, one of the areas that I have not seen in the last few years, I guess, is much in the way of uh, working with, with, uh, with students and younger students. Um, there is maybe more with colleges, but uh, I would like to see even more, more of that. So there, there's quite a few things that we have on our list to do. Um, it's just a matter of finding the time to, to, to get them to do that. And with that, that means uh, everybody has ideas, you know, coming forward and helping, helping to make those ideas uh, come through. So no, that's one of the, like the, the benefits, I think, of having a, court, a, a night like tonight is we get a lot of people that have, um, have been around with the group for a long time and know what kinds of things we did in the past that maybe we've lost sight of. By the way, this is not just a, an issue with the Lincoln Group, but with roundtables and other organizations. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're all trying to figure out something to do. Well, and one of the things that that I can I can tell you from you know my background is in science and I was president of of a regional chapter of a of a big scientific organization. We always had new members coming up the pipeline because they were the students and the students the college students and the professors were usually part members of our group, and there was a lot of benefit to the students to hang around with people who had some experience because they were all looking for jobs after they got their degrees. The Lincoln Group is, is very different. You know, we are a, a, an older group um, of people who are interested in a pretty narrow topic. Um, there aren't, uh, you know, where a lot of us are retired. 
And so we're not going to be giving jobs to new students necessarily, although a lot of, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people and everybody here knows a lot of people. So there probably is an opportunity. So it isn't as natural a, a, a replacement mechanism as there is in, in the kind of organizations I was in before. Um, but that just means we need to work harder. And we have been reaching out and Ed, Ed Steers and, and John O'Brien and I did the program for the uh, Encore Learning, which is uh, basically continuing ed for, for older people and retired people. Um, and we're doing these, these outside groups. I mean, when uh, certainly um, Karen knows because she, we're basically for this event this year, we're essentially copying the concept that, that she used to lead the, the group in the second um, inauguration, 2015, which was on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. So we're using that same sort of system. Uh, and then she was also uh, involved in the, the first inaugural, which is, I guess, in, in the uh, Capitol Visitor Center. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been other events like that. So those are outreach events that, that I'm in favor of doing a lot more of. But I think uh, uh, Carolyn and some others mentioned, um, and, and Charlie mentioned, talking to, uh, talking to libraries and churches and, you know, smaller groups that we can do as individuals or as a group to reach out to more of the public. And then I don't know how we, we, we sort of um, went away from, from Ed here. But <laughs> the, uh, one of the things that, that Ed was talking about is some of the politicians that were involved in it. And John Chamberlain put a note in the comments a while back in the chat. Um, we had people from the Congress and from the administration that they were involved right from the beginning, from starting the group um, and up through at least in the eighties. And I'm not sure how much beyond that. And we don't have that much in the way of uh, congressional activity or, or even staff members. And some of that I think is because of 9-11 and, and some of it is because of the moving you know, it's far further apart, the two parties further apart, they don't want to agree on anything. So that makes it difficult. Yeah. Carl, do you have a comment? Yeah, Ken, I was wondering if we could uh, possibly approach Illinois congressmen, because after all, Illinois does have a stake in Lincoln, claiming they're the state of Lincoln. And uh, so approaching Illinois congressmen, uh, including the senators, certainly wouldn't be a bad start to uh, reach out to congressmen. Well, we have we have worked with congressmen, and and we've had bipartisan uh, activities in recent years. That uh, John O'Brien and John Elif before him were involved with getting the Lincoln uh, the Lincoln uh, Room designated, and there are a few other events that have been been held there. So there is is a fairly narrow group of Illinois uh, congressmen that have. Uh, banded together at least on on certain types of things yeah but i would mean recruiting as members yeah there are there are other there are other yeah the, see that's the other part is that we are the lincoln group of dc not the lincoln group of illinois so we we also want to look at dc representatives which aren't congressmen but the city and um maryland and, and virginia so that's an area that we can we can expand in. <laughs> and you have anything? David, you might you might remember some years ago at the church, New York Avenue Church. Uh, we had an event where Edna Green Medford brought a bunch of her students from Howard to the meeting, and that's the last time I've ever seen any college <laughs> students involved. But that's another source of reaching out. To, yeah. Well, we. <laughs> this Lincoln Memorial may may open us up to more more involvement because uh, we uh, well I've been in contact with uh, this magazine up in the Berkshires where Daniel Chester French's um, uh, studio is. They're doing a piece on the Lincoln Memorial, including what we're doing. Uh, Ed, Ed Epstein uh, 
work through John Kelly and the Washington Post to get that piece that was in the Post a week or so ago. Uh, that's led to people reaching out to us, including uh, I talked this morning to, uh, or yesterday, to a, a producer for a CBS uh, Sunday morning program. They're putting together a program and, and you know, they're, they're either, they're both interviewing us and taking ideas from us, but they're also promoting us. So that's, that's all good. We can, we can use that. So if you know anybody in the media, tell them about the Lincoln Memorial and get them, get them doing pieces about it. We should see more. There have been others that have reached out. So, uh, David, before you adjourn this group, I'm not pushing, but I want to make sure that all the past presidents stay on for a moment so we can get a group uh, <clears throat> Zoom shot here. I'll include uh, Bob Willard, uh, uh, Linda Illith, if you would uh, join us for that, that'd be great. So sorry to intrude, go ahead. Yes, quite, there's quite a few people. Uh, uh, Karen, you had something you want to say. Yeah, there's one thing I'd really like to see the Lincoln Group do. There's absolutely no reason why we cannot have an annual symposium, just like the Lincoln Forum, like the Lincoln Institute. We've got, we've got plenty of people, qualified people, talented people in this area, which could come to the, the Lincoln uh, you know, symposium. And most of the, the young people that I work with at the National Archives that are working there, the reason they don't come to the meetings is number one, they don't get off work until 6, 6.30 at night. They've got a family to go home and take care of and they don't have the money for a dinner. And so I think the Lincoln Group has got to keep the Zoom as an option for expanding to reach the younger generation, as well as forming a partnership with politics and prose and getting Lincoln scholars who are publishing new books to have a talk at politics and prose who will more than gladly have books available for them to purchase. That way we're supporting the, the bookstores and uh, I, I think that would be a great partnership. So, you know, and then I, as a teacher, former teacher, I would love to see us invest the money in a good Lincoln children's book. And on February 12, different Lincoln members would go around to different elementary schools and read the book to the children. And then they would get their own Lincoln book. I think David has one. <laughs> so, you know, you'd have to have different books for different grades. So, you know, for the elementary kids, you want, you want to have a good picture book uh, with Lincoln. And, uh, you know, them having their own book that they can take home for a lot of these kids, that's going to be one of the only books that they have at home that they will cherish. That's a good idea. So. Well, you have one, David. <laughs> You suggesting you suggesting we we pick books that somebody else has written or we write one or two. We could either write one or we could pick among the several Lincoln scholars that we've got. Let's pick a book for grades one through six, and then pick pick another one six through nine. Pick another one for high school, and let's start encouraging high school students have an essay contest where they can get a savings bond. Uh, let's encourage college students to publish on the, the Lincoln group, uh, reach out to the different universities, you know, for these kids that that would be their first opportunity of, of having something that they've done published uh, and, and start encouraging them to participate, have different themes within Lincoln's life that they can write about. And so they're beginning their, their uh, writing uh, experience and using the Lincoln group. So just some thoughts. Uh, wonderful thoughts. And of course, so we can do more with, uh, with more volunteers. Uh, uh, right. People on uh, this call who would like to, uh, to help with any of these initiatives would be fabulous. We'd be happy to work with you to organize it. We're always trying to get uh, fresh people uh, to involve with the, really the hard work it takes to organize and, and produce these events, but it's very worthwhile. Uh, if you would like to do that, why don't you uh, send me or David your, uh, uh, your email and just let me know if you're interested and we'll, we'll, we'll support you in, in creating uh, these initiatives uh, that everybody has uh, wonderful ideas for. But 
Um, that's that's the key. We are else. open to all sorts of ideas. It's just a matter of mm. who, who's going to follow through on them. We need champions mm. to. Yeah. Well, to, those to, of us that are past presidents, we know exactly how hard it is to get. Yeah, to yeah, it's it's, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's not easy. No, it's um, not. Okay, I think I think we'll. You know, Ed, did you have any last comments before we wrap this up? No, 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 no. no. I, I was just going to say we did att attempt to do an essay contest in school and give a $25 savings bond. We only got two entries. So we decided to give both of them a $25 <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't exciting. It was an exciting night, though, Ed, for the children. The child, the, I remember the children yeah. with their parents. It was very, they really enjoyed it. You know, getting the bond and that type of thing, really. It's hard to do. Mm. So let's, let's, uh, everybody thank Ed Steers for, oh. for opening up his, 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 his history to us. Thank you for inviting me. You know, David, in the last year, I, I had more activity with the Lincoln Group than in the previous 30. Thanks to Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Zoom and COVID-19. Yeah. <laughs> Michelle, did you have something you wanted to say? Michelle Crow? No, it was just clap, it was just clapping hands. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's let's yeah. call it a night, except for all of the people that are past presidents or related to past presidents or want to be a future president <laughs> <laughs> and are volunteering right now to be the next in line. <laughs> Um, but if you're, if you have anything to do with, with past presidents or future presidents, stay on the line and, uh, we want to get a picture. Uh, okay. uh Pat Tyson, you have something to say, Pat? Huh? Hi there. Hi. Hi. You know, I, I sort of be, um, been out and, and muted myself because the, the telephone rings too much, <laughs> but, um, and I just hung up on a call right now. So I could just, uh, offer a comment. I think all of the suggestions about how to get young people involved is, are excellent. Um, and I would say that uh, on the other, uh, one of the other ideas, um, it would be good to have a symposium on Lincoln. That was, I, I, listen, I knew nothing about the Lincoln Group um, until um, the Military Road School uh, Preservation Trust gave, you, we used to give symposiums because when we got started, we needed a purpose for existing. And so education was it. But since we came from the, uh, evolved from Fort Stevens in the Civil War, we gave only Civil War symposiums. And Susan Dennis and her husband used to come to those symposiums. And that's how I found out about the Lincoln Group. So um, sometimes it's where you go, you know, you don't know who you're gonna meet. Um, and, uh, uh, after meeting her and her husband, you know, I, I tried to find out more about what they were up to. And so that's how I got jump involved with the Lincoln Group. And Didn't John great, Elif used to it's put It's been a great on? investment. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't John Elif used to put a symposium on? And who? Yeah. John Elif, when he was president. Didn't the mm -hmm. group have a symposium in the past? Yeah. Oh, no, we, had, we used to have symposiums regularly, but uh, yeah, we had several. them for several years. No, yeah. this was years, several years ago, yeah. Right, we yeah. had a symposium on the Lincoln and the Constitution and had DeWitt, we had a JAG from the Army. We had a symposium on Dakota War of 1862. Uh, we've had several symposiums. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we didn't do it the last couple of years and then before COVID and then last since COVID, we obviously haven't done one. So it's been a while. We're, we're overdue. You should do one. Okay, so it's thank you, everybody. That's, that's not a, a president or near president. And um, <laughs> if uh, anybody who isn't, you know, please get off the call. And <laughs> I'll leave it to John O'Brien to uh, identify people that he wants to throw off if there's somebody left. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Wonderful program. I know. Yes, thank you. I want to say hello to Carolyn. I haven't seen you in a long time. Hi, Carolyn. Uh, hi, Charlie. <laughs> how, how, how's, uh, how's Arizona? Uh, hot. It's getting hot. <laughs> <laughs> good to see you. Good Same to see you. Hey,
Yeah. Do we have everybody? Uh, Linda Weiner, are you still there? No. Oops. Who, who did we lose? I think you lost a lot of people. <laughs> okay. But, all right, we're here then. Uh, Susan Dennis, are we going to see your game face? No. <laughs> well. I have my COVID beard. Oh, okay. Terrific. <laughs> we got we got a president. Look at the Link the former yeah. president. The screen. Okay. Carolyn, could you sit a little closer to your I camera? Would really, I, John, I would really rather you had a, a picture of John than me on this. Um, don't you think that would be better? Well, right now we have you, and I have pictures of John. I'll add them, but then, oh, well, thank okay. you, Linda. We're glad you're here. It's, you can do your you. impression of, of John. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how good you are. <laughs> so I'm looking at a list of former presidents, and we're, Miles was on earlier, so we missed him. Uh, Charlie's still here. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, Brenda Pascal was on the phone, so we wouldn't be able to see her. Anymore. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. And Carolyn, of well, course. This is the group. On the count of three, then, nice big uh, smiles. Of course, uh, Steve. Look straight at the camera. One. Ed, sit closer to the camera. Come on. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now we can recognize you now. Good. One, two, three. And once more, change your smile, or we'll relax. <laughs> One, two, three. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm uh, really glad you were joining us. Tonight. Great. Thank, Thank you all. And if you have any, if you have any ideas, this group, if you have any ideas of uh, yourself or somebody else that uh, you'd like to see do something like what Ed did, to talk about history or your own your own time as as president. Um, please, please, please reach out to us. So we want to capture as much of our history as we can, um, while we can. Just, just, just think. Just make believe that Steven Spielberg <laughs> is is doing a oral history party. <laughs> Get Daniel Day uh, Lewis to come in. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks John. Nice. Thanks, Ed, for, for doing this. Good night. Good night.